Welcome back. This is Larry Benko, W0QE, and this video is about RF attenuators such as those shown in the picture. Attenuators are a very integral part of making RF measurements. Reducing large signals down to a level compatible with power meters and spectrum analyzers, reducing a signal generator minimum output for receiver measurements, and setting the levels of a frequency standard in a distribution network all use attenuators. They can also be used to moderate maximum SWR based on their attenuation. I received a question from a guy who had bought a small VNA, like a nano VNA, and he had built what he thought to be a 6 dB attenuator, which is shown in these two resistors, R1 and R2. And if we look at SimSmith, SimSmith shows for a 1 watt input 50 ohm generator and a 50 ohm output, a quarter of a watt. Now, let's look at these numbers a little more closely. And the wattage number here can be if we click on this, left click on this, we see up arrow W. That's the power consumed in this block. If we click on it again, we see dBW, which is again one watt going into the block. Here we see minus three dBW being consumed in the block. And finally, one watt going into the block. So we have a watt going into the block and we have a half a watt being consumed in the block. This block has a half a watt going into it. It has a quarter of a watt consumed in this resistor. And we can do, do that in terms of dBW also, which is dB relative to a watt. Likewise, the load has either, whether, whether it's the power across the resistor here, or whether it's the power coming into the load, in this case, since there's no place for the power to go, they're the same number. But we see a, a one watt going in and, and, and a quarter watt coming out. And if we take 10 log of that, we get 6 dB, actually 6.02 dB. And this would look to be like a 6 dB attenuator. We can also look at voltages and currents across the components. Up arrow means the voltage and current across the part. Large V and I means the voltage and current into the part. This, the arrow is horizontal, so it's across the part and what's into the part. And of course, this one, it's the same whether it's here or whether we measure it here. But we can look at these voltages if we wish. He made this statement to me that it worked most of the time, this attenuator, but not all the time. Now it's kind of interesting. So let's plot the attenuator real quickly. Let's sweep in, in megahertz. And we see that it's got a quarter of a dB, excuse me, a quarter of a watt output, which is the same as well, this line here is the line we dr can drag this. We can change anything, make any any of these um, labels to be the rotation point. And we can slide them up and down by just holding the mouse down and moving the, uh, the field. Or we can scroll. We can scroll over a huge, a huge range we want. And by doing the, the two of those in conjunction, we can pretty much put the plot anywhere we want. So here I'm going to click on six, minus 6. I'm going to zoom in some. And we can see that this is minus 6.02 dB. And that looks pretty good. We look at the SWR coming into here. Move that scale up a little bit. We see it, and it works the same way too. I can set this to be the center point when we rotate, or when we zoom in and out. I can set this to be. So if I leave this alone and I move and I scroll my wheel, I can change the scale on the SWR chart. Hopefully, everybody has seen me do this enough times that this is all very familiar. And so this looks pretty much like a a 6 dB attenuator. So what could possibly be wrong with this circuit? In order to try to figure out what was wrong with the previous attenuator, let's look at what commercially available attenuators look like. And we can do a search for RF attenuator calculator, and we'll come up with a bunch of different calculators, and they will calculate the component values necessary to make an attenuator. So the first thing let's do is let's pick a topology. There was T, pi, bridge T, and there's formulas for how, what the component values are for all of those. And let's, let's use a pi attenuator. Let's enter 6.02 dB. And let's enter 50 ohms for the impedance. 
and we get two components values. The shunt components are 150 ohms, the series component is 37.5 ohms. And now let's look at that on a SimSmith circuit, which, which has been divided into two individual circuits. The original circuit, which was shown here, and the new calculated one we just did here. And the first thing we notice is both of them, well, right here in the load generator block, I'm cloning the generator, cloning the load, which means whatever impedance is to the left of this block, I use, and whatever generator is to the right of this block, I use here. I can also set these to be individually, individual generators, and they can have different powers. But a lot of times when you compare circuits, you want the same load, and you want the same generator. So here we have the, the Pi attenuator. Here we have an L network attenuator. And the first thing we're going to do is let's, we see the power on both of them as a quarter watt output. Both of them have an SWR. Let's look at the SWR on both of them. R2 shows an SWR right here. And R5 shows the other SWR. What I've done is I'm sweeping the, re the impedance here, just the resistive piece of it, from 0.5 ohms to 5,000 ohms. So it's 100 to 1 SWR. And both of these, they, don't, they have slightly different curves, but they both have a 1, a 1 to 1 SWR at 50 ohms, which is what you'd expect when you design the attenuator. If we look at the power output of both of them, the power output of the one that was originally thought to be suspect versus the other one, we see the powers are different, but it, again, at 50 ohms, they're exactly the same. So this should be a clue to us. The first thing, is, the first clue that we get here is the fact that while they appear to be the same at 50 ohms, at every other impedance, they act as a different value of attenuator. So that's kind of interesting. And now let's add a third load generator block to the previous circuit. But this one will have no circuit in between. It's kind of a null circuit. It has a generator and a load. That's all it has. And we're going to let it, it be a 0.25 watt generator. So we need to change this to be 0.25 watts. And when we do that, these, other, these two generators now will be too small in value we need to raise, raise them back up to be one watt. So we'll do that by just clicking on UZ0 for that one and UZ0 for this one. Now, if we look at these outputs to the three loads, we see 0.25 watts, 0.25 watts, 0.25 watts. And now let's look at the differences between the three circuits. The first circuit is going to be the gold standard. It's a generator directly into a load. We would expect, get rid of everything I don't need here. We would expect this one to have maximum power output, which is minus 6 dB or a quarter, or a quarter minus 6 dBW or a quarter of a watt. So it'd be a, at a 50 ohm load. This one we'd expect to work the same way. And it does. We don't see it here because as you as you go across this direction, anything you plot writes on top of what's before it. So we we'll get rid of LG2. We see LG1 underneath of it. We put LGT on LG2 power on top of it, and we see they're right on top of each other. So these two circuits work the same way in terms of the power delivery versus varying load impedances. This one we see does not. It produces the correct power at when the load's 50 ohms, but it produces a larger power output when the load is about 80 ohms or so. And if we look at SWRs, we can see that the SWR for the for this L network is correct at it's at one to one SWR at a 50 ohm load. For the Pi network, it's correct, and for the generator directly connected, it's correct too. Now, this is a much steeper SWR curve due to the fact there's no attenuation in this circuit, and attenuation moderates SWR uh, considerably, but they, all, these, all these are correct. What, I, what we do notice, though, is that by commenting, these were commented out, these, this two slash slashes comment these, this, this statement out, and there's three statements here. We're looking from L dot 
reverse Z going backwards this way. We're looking at LG1 going back this way. And we're looking at LG2 going back this way. What we see, and I'm plotting them right, right here. What we see is this one looks like 83 ohms looking back. So this has an 83 ohm output impedance. This circuit and this circuit both have 50 ohm output impedances. And that is the difference. And the difference is significant. You know, that's significant. A very interesting thing is that if we take this circuit and reverse it like this, and then of course look at the SWR to uh, still at R1, what we now see is actually you should probably get rid of just get rid of SWRs. Don't worry about them for a moment. What we see is one curve. All three curves are exactly on top of each other. And this was what the guy with who, who had um, contacted me was complaining about. He said sometimes this circuit worked and sometimes it didn't. Well, when he plugged it in this way, it appeared to work as far as the um, output power was concerned. But if you looked at SWR, it didn't work. If you flipped it the other way, the SWR appeared to be okay, but the power output didn't. Anyways, uh, that was a solution. I never heard back from, from him whether or not that was indeed the fa it fact, but I'm pretty sure that was the case. It's uh, quite interesting how this works, the attenuators, all the ones you would ever buy commercially are all symmetrical. Now they're not symmetrical with respect to power uh, because this resistor will see more power than this resistor will see. And in a high power application, it may make sense to label one input of the, of the attenuator as being the input and one being the output. But in fact, they're all identical in terms of their, in terms of the impedance of the resistors. Now to finish this up, Let's let Sim Smith act like the web-based calculators for calculating attenuators based on the system impedance and the attenuation in dB. And what I did is divided, divided the Sim Smith circuit into three small circuits, and I have a ruse block in each one of those circuits. Each ruse block is a complete attenuator. And what we see is for a 10 dB attenuator, R1 and R2, excuse me, um, R1 and R3 will be 96.25 ohms, R2 will be 71.15, and etc. Uh, across these uh, different attenuator topologies. I used the formulas that you would see on the, on the web pages, and I have commented out a couple things here at the bottom. And these things at the bottom, if, I wish to, if you wish to uncomment those out, just do this. And what will happen is Sim, Sim Smith will calculate the power needed for each of those resistors also. And the web apps usually don't show power, but if you want to build a power attenuator, knowing the power in these, in these individual resistors is actually uh, kind of a nice thing to know. And what we see is 50 watts into this resistor when we have a 100 watt power input. 32 into this resistor, 5 into this resistor, which is why some power resistors have an input and output labeled on the attenuator. And even though they're symmetrical as far as component values are concerned, they're certainly not in terms of size of the physical resistors inside. Some uh, power attenuators don't make that distinction. That means that the power that the resistors on both sides can handle the full the full 51 watts in the case of it being a 10 dB attenuator. If we want to vary this attenuation, all we do is just dial the number up and down and we see the resistor values changing immediately. And let me get rid of these. So let's look at just um, the power output. And SWR is one to one across frequency, of course. And let's. So here is. So zero dB is full power. Full power is tw plus 20 dBW, 20 dB above a watt, which is, a, which is 100 watts. And let's start. I'm just going to click here, and I'm going to scroll this mouse wheel. 1 dB, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, etc. We see those work just fine. Same with this. this we have to turn this attenuator on.
Works the same way. And the same with same with this one too. Now, what can we do with these attenuators? Well, these attenuators can be saved as files, and we can save them as files a couple of different ways. We can take the attenuator, drag it down here to this. Oops, drag it down here, and it already has. Um, three in here, which were the three in the circuit. But I could get down here and I could let, let go of it down here and I could give it a new name. We'll call this Pi Attenuator New. And we'll say OK. And we have that attenuator now saved. And if we wanted to load it ever, we could go over here and in the it, where we saved it, there it is. Take it, just drag it out here, and put it in any circuit I want. So anytime I'd ever want to use a pi attenuator, I could put it in a circuit. I could come down here and set its impedance to be whatever I wanted to for the circuit use. I, you know, I could set its attenuation to be whatever I wanted, and it will give me the resistor values for the attenuator and what power each of the resistors will consume based on whatever I have generators or whatever voltages are in in the circuit. So these can be used. I use I have ruse blocks that have complete antenna tuners in them. A, a T tuner, a Pi tuner. I have one that has a complete Johnson matchbox in it. I have one that has a Z match tuner in it. And it's very easy to compare uh, the different tuners if you wish. But anyways, this is a really powerful feature of SimSmith to be able to just save these things. And of course, there's components you can drag it around. It actually, it's even better than that. Let me bring up another con instance of SimSmith. And we'll do File, New Circuit here. We'll make this one just a little bit smaller. Drag it from here to there, and it goes right into the circuit. I can also drag it directly. Let me bring up a, here's a foldered, uh, a blank folder. I can also drag these directly into a blank folder. And there it is too. They will end in SSCE and um, they, they're, they're a text file, of course. Um, here's the contents of what's in them. But uh, they're a component. SimSmith can use them as a component. And it's a really powerful feature of SimSmith to be able to have a repertoire of various things that you use fairly often and want to, um, you know, have quick access to. Hope you found the video interesting. Um, if you do, let me know. If you don't, uh, let me know also. Talk to you later.